Hello, in this podcast we're looking at biological hazards and our objective is to describe how the global disease burden is changing. Here are the top 10 infectious diseases worldwide and one thing you may notice is that some of these are not all that common around here. Like, well, we all know about AIDS and sometimes meningitis rears its, rears its head around here. Most of these we don't see. Malaria is basically unknown here in the United States. Tuberculosis, we don't see all that much. People here get diarrhea, but they don't die from it. So why are so many people worldwide dying from it, but not we don't see it here in the United States? Here is one reason. Here are the causes of human mortality, where we look at developed countries and also the least developed countries. If you notice, in the developed countries, only 7% of the people die from communicable diseases. Communicable diseases communicable diseases are diseases that can be spread from person to person while in the least developed countries that number is 54 percent so here in the United States it's not rep the disease burden is not representative while in the least developed countries there it is in other words most of the people who die of disease will be in a least developed country we can see here how the these disease burdens are changing over time. Back in 1990, we have here a list here where the top three are pneumonia, diarrhea, and perinatal conditions. And then in 2020, when many of the least developed countries have made their demographic transition, then it shifts to what we see more here in the United States, heart disease, depression, and traffic accidents. So why are infectious diseases so prevalent in developing countries? Well, one reason is the this contamination of food and water and this has to do with frequently a lack of resources for sanitation and also a lack of education and also due to the ideal climates of vector-borne diseases like malaria vector-borne means that it's vector is what's carrying it and malaria is carried by mosquitoes now, now the way to improve this is to have, if, they have better if they have better nutrition, if they have clean water, if they improve their sanitation, like if, they, if they're treating their sewage and their drinking water doesn't get contaminated, and also vaccinating children. Would now here are some vocabulary words you need to know. Morbidity is the incident of disease in the population. So if someone gets sick, that will increase the morbidity rate. Mortality is the incidence of death. Now the dailies are disability adjusted life years and this is very important in seeing the impact of the disease burden because the uh, if someone who's say 95 years old dies of pneumonia that's going to have much less of an impact on the on society than someone who dies of pneumonia at the age of 6 months because someone who's 95 years old wouldn't live for all that long and is already contributed just about everything that will be contributed to society while well, someone who is six months old hasn't contributed anything yet and has a whole lifetime that could be contributed and doesn't contribute any and also the mortality rate doesn't include what happens to society if someone becomes disabled that could be from illness or it could be from getting uh, or just an injury Epidemiology is the study of presence, distribution, and control of disease in a population. An infectious disease is a disease that is caused by a pathogen, as opposed to some non-infectious diseases like, like there are genetic diseases which are, which are inherited from your parents and you cannot catch it. And then transmissible or communicable diseases I covered a little bit earlier, and that's something that can be transmitted between people. An example of an infectious disease that is not transmissible would be something like food poisoning. WHO is the World Health Organization? And that's the agency of the United Nations that specializes in, in public health. And they focus on communicable diseases and they also look at non-communicable uh, non diseases and they also focus on other areas like um, healthy eating and also substance abuse. Now, infectious diseases are caused by pathogens, and pathogens are disease-causing organisms. And the types of organisms could be bacteria, like E. coli. Well, most E. coli is beneficial. Some of them do cause, uh, do cause diseases.
and also tuberculosis. Fungi, um, coccidiomycosis, is a fungus that causes something else known as valley fever. It causes flu-like symptoms, and that's something that's found in mainly like the southwest United States. Example of viruses would be the influenza virus and also the chickenpox virus. Protozoans are single-celled organisms. Most of them are not parasites, but examples of those could be giardia, which will cause, uh, which cause dysentery or diarrhea. And also malaria is another protozoan. And also worms are examples of parasites. Examples of those would be tapeworms or ascarids. One major concern are pandemics. And pan a pandemic is a worldwide epidemic. And the largest one was almost 100 years ago in 1918. That was the Spanish flu. 20 to 50 million people died. That was So more people died from the Spanish flu than died in World War I. And what was unusual about that flu was that most of the people who died of that flu were in their teens or early 20s. Most people who die of the flu are either the very young or the very old. Where would the next pandemic be? It must most likely be an emergent disease because diseases that have been around for a long time, the, the disease has evolved, most likely would have evolved not to become deadly because the, a disease, the pathogens would evolve to be able to be passed on and stay around. If, the, if their host dies, then the pathogen dies with it. So usually it's an emergent disease. An emergent disease is a disease that's new to our species. And Spanish flu most likely was an emergent type of flu. Another emergent disease is AIDS. Uh, that first reared its head back in the 70s. I'm going to go over a few major diseases. First one is smallpox. Smallpox had a 30% mortality rate, and it was very, very contagious. Uh, symptoms included a high fever, fatigue, head and back aches, head and back aches, a rash in the face, arms and legs, and it had a huge role in history in, in that it, it killed many leaders in history, like uh, I think uh, Queen Mary, who was just before Queen Elizabeth, and also in the early 1500s, it wiped out the native slave labor force on the El on the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean. And these were replaced by African slaves that set a precedent for African slave labor in the Americas. It also was used in biological warfare in the American Revolution because smallpox is not so common in America so that most people were not immune to it, while it was more common in Europe, so that it, the English would try to infect the American soldiers with smallpox. And Washington's response was to was basically to use an early form of vaccination, which was help was helpful, but unfortunately, many people ended up catching smallpox from the vaccination too. Now, vaccination itself completely eradicated smallpox in 1977, but there are fears that some nations have the virus and may use it as a weapon. We do know of two nations that have the virus under lock and key, just in case something happens and we can have something to work with, and those two nations are the United States and Russia. Here is the life cycle of the parasite that causes malaria, and it infects both us and the mosquito. And what happens is that when mosquito gets its blood meal from a person, then the sporozyte comes out uh, through comes out of the mosquito, and it finds its way to the liver. And in the liver, it reproduces asexually, and then it releases merozoites, which will which will infect the blood cells. And that's when a person will, will start uh, in feeling the disease itself, the symptoms of the disease. They'll, fe they'll get anemia, they'll get um, high fever, and it's all caused by the destruction of the blood cells. And merozoites will produce gametocytes, both males and females, and then a mosquito will come along and will get a blood meal from the sick person and will itself become infected. And the, the males and females will mate inside the mosquito, producing an oocyst, which will then go through meiosis and produce sporozytes, so that when the mosquito takes another bite, it will infect the next person. The Center of, of Disease Controllers, CDC, estimates that there are, are 300 million to 500 million cases of malaria each year, and more than 1 million die. It is the greatest disease hazard to travelers in the, to the tropics. So if you ever travel to the tropics, make sure that you 
take your medicine as well as medicines for other for other diseases of the tropics too. We did come close to eradicating it. It used to be in the United States. But the way we eradicated it was by killing those mosquitoes using pesticides like DDT. What stopped us from eradicating us was two things. First was that the mosquitoes evolved. They developed an insecticide resistance and also the parasite evolved too and it evolved to develop resistance to the medicines, to the antibiotics. Next is AIDS in the United States. More than half a million people have died since 1981. 15,000 die every year. African Americans are more likely to be infected than Caucasians. Under males, it's seven times more likely, and females are 20 times more likely. And the fastest growing population for new infections are 15 to 24 years old. Obviously, people can take uh, People can take methods to prevent the infection, like where, like having safe sex, and in people who have it, medicines can increase the dailies. In the developing world, as of 2010, 34 million people have contracted it, and most of the new infections, more than two-thirds of them, are in sub-Saharan Africa, that's south of the Sahara Desert. And unfortunately, antiviral treatments are expensive so that only 23% of the children in the developing world get the treatment and only 40% of the adults are getting the antiviral treatments. Also, there's a very strong stigma associated with AIDS. There's, uh, it's associated with homosexuality, even though it's mostly spread through heterosexual sex. Another major disease is tuberculosis, and that's a chronic bacterial infection. It primarily infects the lungs, and it's spread by inhaling droplets spread into the air by coughing and sneezing. A third of the world's population is infected. Three million die every day, and 98% of that is in the developing world. And as you see in the following clip, multiple antibiotic resistance is rising. Viruses, bacteria, and other microbes may be all but invisible to us. But that doesn't mean we don't play a huge role in their evolution. The way we use antibiotics, for instance, has a lot to do with which ones survive, the helpful ones or the harmful ones. Tuberculosis, the leading infectious killer of adults in the world today, is caused by bacteria. And it has become one of the most lethal, especially in Russia, where evolution on a cellular level has resulted in some tuberculosis bacteria that are resistant to drugs, threatening the survival of hundreds of thousands. This is ground zero of a global tuberculosis epidemic. Russia's crowded prisons provide a perfect breeding ground for the transmission of tuberculosis. <laughs> tuberculosis is spread through the air and is therefore a very threatening disease in that someone could cough and a few hours later someone walking into that room could inhale the air and become sick with tuberculosis. People who do become sick with tuberculosis develop a cough and fever and begin losing a lot of weight. If you look at the x-ray of the healthy lung, what you see is a lot of dark uh, areas within the lung. That's because the lung is primarily composed of air and that indicates that there's a healthy lung. When you look at the tuberculosis lung, you can see that there are many white areas What's in there is a lot of phlegm and blood and pus. Um, the person is constantly coughing this up when they cough, and it's a sign that the person is quite ill. Like Dr. Jennifer Furin, microbiologist Alex Goldfarb is one of the many health professionals who travels from the United States to Russia to combat multi-drug resistant TB. Every one of you has been diagnosed with multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. In other words, the type of tuberculosis that you have does not respond to regular medications. When people are sick with tuberculosis, we often need to give them more than one medication in order to kill all of the bacteria that are living with inside that person. Treatment begins with one medication, 
the antibiotic kills many of the bacteria. A second dose of the antibiotic kills off even more bacteria, but still some remain alive, resistant to the antibiotic. If the patient does not take all the prescribed antibiotics, these resistant bacteria multiply and pass their resistance to their descendants, and the patient remains sick. In this way, a strain of bacteria evolves to become fully resistant to an antibiotic. And the same cycle can continue until the person is resistant to all the medications that we use to treat tuberculosis. It's a classic example of natural selection. Genetic variation within bacteria strains allows some bacteria to survive even when hit with antibiotics. These surviving bacteria are selected and continue to evolve. That is, survive and reproduce over time, unless treatment is thorough. A single bacterium can reproduce a million times in a single human lifespan. It would be impossible for me to do my work with the sufferers of TB without understanding how evolution works, because evolution is key in how we treat and understand the disease. So why should we be concerned about how evolution happens in a prison halfway around the world? Globalization is not just, you know, financial markets or the information space which became global. The bacterial uh, ecology has also been globalized. We recently heard about a gentleman in, in Russia who was very sick with multidrug resistant tuberculosis and treatment was not available for him in Russia at the time. He boarded an airplane and flew from Moscow to New York City, went straight to a hospital there to get treatment for his multidrug resistant tuberculosis. But in the setting of being on the airplane, he had coughed, the airs recirculated, and 34 people were infected with tuberculosis on that one airplane flight. In the United States, about 10 to 15 million Americans are infected with TB bacteria, and at least 1 million are expected to develop the disease. And here's why antibiotic resistance is rising. We are misusing antibiotics. It was half of the 100 million antibiotic doses prescribed in the U.S. every year are unnecessary or are the wrong drug. Like if you are suffering from a viral disease, then there's no reason for you to take an antibiotic. Antibiotics don't do anything for a, viral, for a virus disease. They work against bacteria. Also, many people don't finish the full course. They feel better, they stop taking it, and then they get sick again, and that will result in the bacteria evolving resistance. Also, more than half the antibiotics are manufactured in the United States and are routinely fed to farm animals to stimulate weight gain. And then it's excreted in the urine the feces, they find the way to the surface water where bacteria are then exposed to it and as we'll see a little bit later, bacteria are able to have sex not just with uh, or exchange genetic information not just with members of their own species but any other kind of bacteria so if it's in one bacteria it can spread which is harmless it can spread to harmful bacteria. Over here you see how evolution, a natural and through natural selection results in antibiotic resistances. When you have a bacterial colony, there's a muta there was a mutation ahead of time, which gives antibiotic resistance. You have a bacterial colony, there's a mutation ahead of time, and some of that bacteria has the gene to, to resist the antibiotics. Antibiotics are given, and the only survivors are the ones that have resistance, so that the colony then grows and all of them have the resistance and few, and that means the antibiotic doesn't work anymore. Now once you have these resistance ones, that's like say this happens to say a soil bacteria and then it comes in contact with the pathogen, it can the, they can have something called conjugation, which is sort of like sex in bacteria. The harmless bacteria can give the gene for antibiotic resistance to the pathogen, and then that drug resistance pathogen can then res can then produce a resistant colony of of uh, the pathogen. Uh, you need to know what em emergent diseases are, and I sort of went into that before. It is one that has never been known before, or which has been absent for at least 20 years. Bird flu, Ebola fever, and HIV are examples of those. HIV is the virus that causes AIDS. 
and what happens is that growing human populations push into remote areas and they encounter new pathogens and that puts into population and also air travel makes it possible to spread the emergent disease around the globe quickly. Like in 2009, H1N1 was first detected in Mexico in April and within weeks it spread across the entire world. Now we come to our concluding questions. Number one, why are diseases so much more prevalent in the developing world? Number two, why is the dailies a better measure than mortality? Number three, what is a pandemic? Number four, how is malaria spread? Number five, what is one misuse of antibiotics that can lead to antibiotic resistance? And that concludes this podcast, and I'll see you in class tomorrow.